keeping the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the Baptist come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argue, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe in him. And this is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. These seem to be two weeks in a row that I get to fill you in on what's happening in my family now that everybody's staying at home uh, all the time. Uh, my wife and I have decided in the last year or so that we will no longer make promises to our kids. You know what I mean? We'll no longer make promises and commit to doing anything for our kids. So when the kids really, really want a particular meal for dinner tonight, and it was not our plan, we will no longer say to them something along the lines of, no, we already have broccoli and chicken planned for tonight. I promise 
we'll have homemade pizza, mom's homemade pizza, on Friday night. We don't do that. And you know why we don't do that? Because Friday night gets here, and the kids want Dawn's homemade pizza, which incidentally is like a three and a half hour ordeal from crust to plate. And so inevitably, we get to Friday, and something comes up. Dawn's held up late at work uh, one day, or the kids have some kind of pop-up commitment that makes fulfilling the promise that we have made for homemade pizza tragically difficult and sometimes impossible. And so when we tell them that we'll have to do it another night and it doesn't happen, we are labeled as flip-floppers at best and liars at worst. But you promised. And it's not, for, it's not enough for us to explain to them, yeah, I, I know I said yes, but now I have changed my mind and I need to say no. We won't promise them that their friends can come over or that we'll, be, that we'll be going kayaking tomorrow or that we'll go out for ice cream at the Woodside Farm or that we can go shopping for new clothes or pretty much anything because we might have to change our minds. In fact, I have even started employing that tactic here at work because as much as I really want to come through with something that I've promised to do, I have learned Things happen, circumstances change, and we're all just going to have to be flexible with that. Changing one mind, even beyond my little example, indicates that you didn't just land on an idea and decide never to revisit that idea again. Changing one's mind means that you are constantly willing to reconsider something given new learning, new facts, new experiences. Changing one's mind means giving up power and admitting that things are no longer perhaps what you thought they were. Changing one's mind means there's a possibility you might have been wrong in the first place. The ability and willingness to change one mi one's mind plays at the center of today's gospel lesson. In response to the question by the chief priests and the elders, now, this is the group, this is the group that is ultimately going to put Jesus to death. In response to their question about by what authority Jesus is doing the teaching that he's doing, this teaching which seems to overturn everything that they had been taught as children and everything that they are teaching now as chief priests and elders of the temple. Everything that has been taught since Moses. Jesus is overturning. And in response to the question about that, Jesus tells them a parable. He says, two sons are instructed by their father to go out into the vineyard. The first one says no, but later changes his mind and goes to work in the vineyard. The second one says, yes, I'll go, but he never goes. Which of the two does the will of the father, Jesus asks the chief priests and the elders, and they answer, the first one did. And they're right, Jesus says. Truly I tell you, his conclusion is, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. You holy people. You temple people. You churchy people. They are going ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. You did not revisit your actions and beliefs and believe him. You didn't consider new learning, new facts, new experiences, new encounters with people and believe him. 
you did not give up your power and consider that maybe things are no longer as you thought. You did not consider that maybe, just maybe, you may have been wrong from the start. See what Jesus is doing here? He's taking the religious people, really the the people who run the temple at Jesus' time, and he's placing them in the place of the second son in the parable, the one who said that he would go into the vineyard but did not go. I mean, yes, Jesus is saying, yes, you're, you're doing God's work, but you're not really doing God's work the work of the Beatitudes. Remember I talked about that last week? Go listen to that sermon from last week. And with the undesirables, at least to the people, these chief priests and elders, prostitutes and tax collectors, people who were on the margins, he equates them with the son who said no initially, but did change their minds and went into the vineyard. Jesus says, when John the Baptist came preaching, chief priests, elders, you're all talking about a different kind of kingdom of God. John's talking about a kingdom filled with forgiveness and love. You didn't change your minds about this new teaching. You act holy and righteous, but there's really no follow-through in terms of how your heart is changed towards other people with love and mercy and grace. They did those ones you think are undesirable, they changed their mind. They heard John's message and they responded. But it's even more complicated than that. Remember, all of this is taught in response to a question about by what authority Jesus has to teach these things at all. I mean, why didn't Jesus just reveal, I have authority, when he's asked, by what authority are you teaching this stuff? Why didn't he just say, well, I have the same authority John the Baptist had? Why didn't he just say, I have authority to do this, or, or I'm the Son of God. Of course I can do this. I think he didn't just go and do that because he was giving them a chance to change their minds. Think about it. Jesus already knew which of these two sons, the elders and the chief priests, were like, even before he told the parable. It was almost like Jesus was giving them a chance to consider what was going on so that they might change their minds. And they did consider it, right? They, they huddled with themselves. If we say that John's baptism was from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe it? And that's actually the question that's haunting them right now. Why didn't we believe it? Should we have believed it? If we do believe it and, and change our minds, what kind of power or position or status or wealth are we winding up giving up? And here's the scariest part for them. If we do change our minds, are we made equal? Go listen to my sermon last week. Are we made equal to them? Jesus is right now in their face challenging the status quo that all of these very pious people live their lives in. Will they change their minds as Jesus puts this parable and this question to them? We know that they won't. Because it's hard to change our minds. It's hard to let people down. It's hard to give up power or status or to think that somehow we might have been wrong to begin with. It's hard to incorporate in new learning. Changing, one, changing one's mind indicates that you just don't land on an idea and never revisit that again. 
It means that you're constantly willing to reconsider giving new learning, new facts, new experiences. It means giving up power and admitting that things might no longer be as you thought. And it means you might have been wrong in the first place. This scripture lesson today, at its heart, is about challenging where you and I stand as people of God. It is about changing our mind, yes, but that means it's about repentance. It's about confession and forgiveness and turning lives around. And I remember as a young boy growing up in the Catholic Church, I used to always think about confession being having to go into that little booth and saying all the things I had done wrong. I hit my brother, I cussed this week, I was mean to someone. But confession and forgiveness is about way more than that. It is about changing where we stand in relationship to God, moving closer to God, or, or, or better said, removing the things that keep us separated or at a comfortable status quo distance from God and letting God break in on our lives no matter what that change means. It sometimes means changing our minds. This lesson is about changing the status quo of our lives. That's why the challenge in my little story at the very beginning of this sermon is actually tougher than we might expect at first. The impossibility of planting a flag in a particular place, of, of thinking one way and never wavering in that kind of thinking. It means that we all learn from science and from experiences and from relationships and from maturity that can cause us to waver in the way we think. And that's okay. Because it's ridiculous to think that we can't change. That things don't change. We're alive and we're living. And so is the earth and so are other people. And frankly, so is God. And because of the living nature of everything and everyone, we have to learn to change and change our minds so that we are able to meet God in the least likely of places, people, and circumstances. Who God is never changes. Pastor John and I have been talking in our daily devotions, if you follow along with us there, about how God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We say it just about every week, I think, John. We encounter those texts lately. That never changes. Never changes. It's always the same. How we understand who that love is directed toward, that can change. And he doesn't do it to us either. The good news of this lesson is that God always welcomes both sons in this parable. The prostitutes and the tax collectors will go into heaven ahead of you, Jesus says. Ahead, not instead. God welcomes people whether they have said yes or no, whether they stay or whether they go. Whether you're a person who says yes, but you never can find the courage to follow through, or whether your inclination is to say no, but your heart moves you to change your mind. By what authority does Jesus do his teaching? In the end, it probably doesn't matter. What matters is that God's love and invitation to live in his kingdom Maybe the better question that they should by what authority do we decide to be so stubborn in
Father in His holy name. Amen. Friends, why don't we stand and sing our hymn is Lead Me, Guide Me. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy. Your son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged 
so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy, turn the nations toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority. Lord, in your mercy, our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Lord, in your mercy, turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Today we pray especially for Ron Henry, Russ Hokinson, Charlie Young, Danny Mason, Judy Parsons, Sherry Thompson, Dana Hauser, Tom DeWeese, John and Barb Williams, Dave Frampton, Ruth Bowles, Kelly Croft, Joe and Lynn Pauser, Lois Hardy, Marge Davis, Nelson and Diane Murray, Trudy Gilganast, John Newcomer Sr., Del Lanker, Colby Sturkin family, Lenore Hoffman, Carol Ruckel, Kevin Meinholt, Barb Hewlett, Hilde Crothers, Sharon Smith, and Stephen Benscoder and family. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. At this time, everyone is invited to offer your own prayers, either aloud or in your hearts. Thank you for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us tax collectors and prostitutes, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share God's peace with one another, and for those who are streaming with us, receive our peace as well. Well, friends, good morning. Welcome to St. Philip's Lutheran Church, where our mission is to make disciples, praise God, and serve the community. Just a few things we want to lift up today. A lot of things in the bulletin Get that off the internet, uh, off our website, uh, or from the link we email out. There's a lot of things happening. Um, I'm going to lift up uh, one, and then John has three things he's going to lift up. Um, just a reminder that we did send out that survey on the Christmas cantata. Um, just uh, we're hoping to do that Christmas. We do it kind of remotely, provide CDs, and it becomes a little bit of a fundraiser for the community. Uh, as well. So uh, if, you, if that is something that you are interested in doing, or even if you're not, let us know so we know what it looks like, whether we can fund that project. Um, and uh, so just respond to that survey. It goes out every week to the congregation in the this week at St. Philip's email. So just kind of check that out. Uh, John, you have three things. So yeah, let me we, just get off the at, stage. At St. Philip's, we have a very busy outreach committee uh, and very busy in October. Uh, there are three things that are happening uh, with outreach that I want to lift up. The first of which is coming up on October 4th. Uh, we are hosting the premier event for Peace Week in Delaware. Uh, we are going to be doing a Zoom meeting with uh, County Executor Matt Meyer and Kim Toole, who is the head of Peace Week in Delaware. Delaware. Uh, there's a sign-up genius uh, to RSVP for that meeting. It's in the This Week at St. Philip's. Uh, it's in the bulletin if you have the online version. Uh, please sign up so we know how many people are there. Um, it's going to be a really interesting gathering. It's something we've never done before, but if you want to know a little bit more about what Peace Week is, how to get involved, and the different projects they've done over the years, it's a really great introductory conversation. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the ELCA has recently released uh, a social message on government and civic responsibility. Uh, the ELCA has a couple governing documents. 
uh, some of which are social statements, some of which are social messages. This is a social message. It's helped to uh, kind of inform us on how we're supposed to live out our baptismal vocations as Christians in the world. So this is on uh, government and civic responsibility. Uh, the outreach team is leading a Zoom study on this uh, document. It's going to be on October 8th from 6.30 to 8 and October 15th. So we're going to have two sessions to cover the whole of the document. Uh, if you're interested in being a part of that, please sign up as well via Sign Up Genius. Uh, there are going to be two sessions to cover roughly 17 pages of uh, documentation. So if you're interested, uh, I think it's really appropriate given where we're going uh, in November. Uh, so if you are interested in that, please sign up. Uh, and the last thing I've got is October 17th, we're going to be doing another drop-off food drive for St. Stephen's. Uh, so in the back of the bulletin, the second to last page, is almost all the information for outreach. Uh, we're going to be doing this from 8 to noon on that Saturday. Uh, there's a list of about 10-ish things, uh, much like we did last time in July for that food drop-off. Uh, so we'd be thrilled if you would... Uh, continue to be as generous as you were for us in summer of service. Uh, but I think at this time we would normally collect our gifts of offerings. You do an amazing job of giving online and dropping things off in the plate. Uh, but we're going to resume with our communion liturgy. So I would invite you to rise as you are able. And let us pray together. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us the gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with the rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We give thanks to you, creating God, breath of all being. The earth is yours and all that is in it and all who dwell therein. You founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the deep. You planted seeds in fertile ground to rise and sing your praise. You formed us from the earth and planted goodness in our souls so that we might love like you. And you call us to live your law of harmony and to long for your commands. O oh God, you sowed your word in Jesus to grow your kingdom here on earth and draw us ever near to you. Jesus planted mercy wherever he went to reap a greater righteousness. He shared bread with outcasts and sinners, and he healed the brokenhearted. That's why in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
remembering his dying and rising with this cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us, and we wait for his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast where all are invited. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts and all your people here today. Breathe your spirit over all creation that together we may cultivate peace in every corner of the world. Come, Holy Spirit. Then, Lord, bring us to that blessed mountain where the meek and pure of heart will live forever in blessedness and peace as together we taste the promised fruits of heaven. Amen. Joined together by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Come to the table of the Lord, where all are welcome. Thanks be to God. I think we're all familiar how we do communion here. All are welcome. Please come.
And so I'd invite you to rise as you are able. And let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.